That's Philip Marsden talking about budgies. In fact, he's talking about Radio Durham's Talking Budgie competition. But before we continue with all about animals today, I've just had a news flash. News as it happens on Radio Durham. One, two. It may not look like a revolution, but 40 years ago, that's exactly what it was. It was an experiment in a new kind of broadcasting. It had just two years to succeed, but there were powerful enemies who wanted it to fail. Here on film, the story of how BBC Local Radio was born and struggled to survive. It all began with Frank Gillard. He'd made his name as a war reporter. By the 1960s, he was head of BBC Radio, and he had a big idea, to bring local radio to Britain. For some stars of the future, it was a first step into the business. I rang them up one day and I said, look, I'm kind of vaguely interested in this, I know nothing about it. Would you be interested in me doing anything or having a look round at least? And they said, oh, yes, come on down. At one point, they looked a bit puzzled about me because I was sort of female and red brick. I wasn't quite the BBC sort. And they said, um, what, in, what would you be prepared to do? And I said, anything. <laughs> they wanted the job. <laughs> and they wrote that down, apparently, and it's still on the form. Another musical selection on this morning's merry-go-round. Gillard got his idea from America, the home of commercial broadcasting, and the land where local radio was thriving. And so with the clock standing at nearly midnight, we bring to a close another day of broadcasting for Cowboy Radio. But Gillard wanted a very British kind of local station. Good morning, this is Radio London, your local BBC station. And here is Michael Payne with the local news. That's the main talking point on the trains this morning as the rush hour crowds stream in. His tactics were carefully planned. He ran local radio experiments in the early 1960s and filmed them to generate publicity as he tried to win over politicians and the BBC itself. Outside in London itself, reporters are on the spot for the latest news, sometimes using radio cars to broadcast live reports into the news bulletins. This is Angus McDermott calling BBC Radio London. He knew that if he was going to win any favour at all with local politicians or indeed national ones, he had to have some good evidence. So he set up these experiments, closed circuit, no broadcasting, in different places. This is your local BBC station serving Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole. And the edited highlights he used as his evidence to appear in front of steering committees in Parliament and his fellow men in the BBC and women who were perhaps a bit sceptical about this local radio idea. But Frank was the master craftsman at knowing how to win favour with people. Gillard wanted stations right across the country, close to their audience, but that wouldn't be easy. They filmed their first attempts to talk to listeners. Excuse me, do you go to the youth clubs in this area? There are plenty of them, but not many young people do seem to go. No, I don't. I stay clear of them. Well, why? Well, they're usually full of hooligans and teddy boys, and I prefer to look for other entertainment elsewhere. They're just not your type? No, definitely not. Gillard and his young reporters had two big problems. Would it be any good? And who'd pay for it? This is Ray Colley calling BBC Radio London. The bill was £50,000 a year to run a radio station. But the real trump card that Frank played was persuading government, this is a Labour government with Harold Wilson, to have an experiment, a two-year experiment, but it wouldn't come from the licence fee it would be from the local authorities themselves or anybody else who would put in, put their hand in the, in the pocket. For the BBC, it was all quite shocking. Eight local authorities offered to pay for the new stations. At the time, it all seems like part of a deliberate plan. As it turned out, they could, the BBC couldn't afford it, but felt it necessary to seize the territory and get established. 
1967, these few cities and towns were in the front line of a broadcasting battle. But some of Gillard's young army didn't have much idea of what they were letting themselves in for. I hadn't a clue what we were going to do. I just needed the job, and I thought that radio and broadcasting looked fascinating. I was in the world of great dramatic and glamorous world of insurance. And uh, I'd been in it for several years, and uh, I, I was getting by and doing very well in, in the business and getting promotions and all that sort of stuff and uh, passing all the exams. And uh, I thought, well, if, if I've got to do this for the rest of my life, so be it. I'll at least make a success out of it. But when local radio turned up, I suddenly got this dreadful bug. I got, I love this. So extraordinary, I gave up my career and took up my hobby. And it's been my hobby ever since. <laughs> In Brighton in 1967, a local filmmaker recorded the arrival of this new kind of broadcasting. For a young Des Lynham, it was the BBC, but not as we'd known it. You felt as though you weren't part of that great organisation, really. I remember it was chaotic, or it seemed to be chaotic, with the guys flashing around. You felt as though you were a little offshoot, and they were sort of throwing you out there, get on with it. And, uh, uh, and the facilities were reasonably limited, and uh, the funding was very limited. Brighton and the new stations had another problem. They'd be broadcasting on VHF, FM, and hardly anybody had the right radios. But change was in the air. Pirate broadcasters played pop from boats. The 60s were starting to swing. Could local radio succeed? And was Auntie BBC the best person to provide it? We hadn't had anything like this before. The only commercial model was either um, Radio Aaron or Radio Luxembourg. They'd been the pirates. But this was nothing like the pirates. This was somewhere between the very old home service and something sort of um, trying to talk in a local voice. The studios are now ready. The workmen are gone. Rehearsals begin in earnest. It was a rush to get on air. Captured on amateur footage, Radio Brighton was looking like a radio station. This is Roger Matthews. Welcome to Radio Leicester. But Radio Leicester was the first to open, going on air on November the 8th, 1967. And what a day. We've had the Postmaster General to open the station, the Lord Mayor of Leicester's had a say, and we've got more visitors in the studio this afternoon. During the next... Broadcasting history was being made. For a young journalist filmed in the studio that morning, it was a day to remember. There I was, a nervous young man uh, at the controls of the radio station that was the first to go on the air uh, in the country. Well, I'll flash right round to my next request, which is from Julie Howard of 18 Foss Road, North Leicester. We don't know who was listening, but for a quarter of an hour we read out local news and traffic information and stuff like that. And then we went into the World at One on BBC Radio 4 and immediately heard ourselves coming back again because it was big, major national news. Britain's first experimental local radio station, Radio Leicester, went on the air about a quarter of an hour ago. The station's first news bulletin told of a telephone call saying a bomb was timed to go off in the station at one o'clock, but the station is in fact still on the air. Soon, eight stations were broadcasting, with a mix of news, sport and local features. But this was an experiment, and it showed. I would be embarrassed to play back some of those programmes today, because we were learning all the time. And half the staff had never been anywhere near a radio station in their lives. It's just after 6am in Stoke-on-Trent. This is John Abberley. Local radio calls him a PA. That stands for Programme Assistant. It might just as well be Jack of All Trades, because John Abberley, like his counterparts in the seven other local stations, is a man of many parts. Reporter, announcer, disc jockey and newsreader. In 1968, BBC Television commissioned a film, Hometown Radio. It was a record of local radio's first year. I think there was some sort of uh, feeling in some quarters that it was all a bit 
all a bit toy town, if that's the word. Um, and, and it was staffed by people who had never worked in broadcasting at the lower levels. Um, and th there was a, I won't call it resentment, a, a misunderstanding, I think, is probably the better word, uh, about what it was going to achieve and how it was going to achieve it. Can you get down there in about five minutes? He's got that counsellor. Great, thanks. There is a, a divided opinion as to whether sodium fluoride should be introduced to water, into the water. Filming in the Midlands, Beasley found that the new arrivals on the airwaves were getting a mixed welcome. I know it takes all sorts to make a world and everybody has their own choice of music, but I prefer the middle of the road stuff, really. I think it's very good because it gives you information on what's happening and where you can go to uh, be entertained and gives you the local news. Not as good as Radio 1. No records on it, is there? Nothing wrong with it, as far as I'm concerned. I just don't want it. Uh, we've got a record coming up right now, which is uh, recorded by a gentleman right. called Kevin King Lear. I never knew that King Lear's first name was Kevin. You learn everything here, don't you? But through the lens, it looked impressive. By being used to scripted programmes, and, and all of a sudden you watch these people at work and they were talking off the top of their head, they were doing things which, which hadn't been rehearsed, for example, and all very, very much um, more informal than the broadcasting that I'd been used to before, but very attractive in, in the sense that it, it was so easy and, and, and um, re responded to, to events much more quickly. Lord Lieutenant, may I invite you please to make a presentation to Chief uh, Fire Officer... Beasley's film showed council meetings being recorded for broadcast. It wasn't obvious entertainment, but the councils, of course, were paying for this experiment. One young politician saw an opportunity. I literally appeared, I think, within a week of the local radio station setting up in 1967. I rang up the local radio station and, of course, in those days, they were desperate to have anybody on. So even though I was unknown, unheard, untutored, they were quite willing to let me have a go. Councils expected airtime and the relationship with local newspapers was becoming uneasy. It was now vital that local radio got the right kind of publicity. So when Beasley wrote to Frank Gillard requesting an interview, Gillard made sure he agreed on his terms and viewers got the right message. By this time next year, we shall be engaged in the business of evaluating uh, for the Postmaster General the success that the stations have had in the period of their, uh, of their operation as experiments. And it's on the strength of the assessment that will be made next year that decisions will be taken whether to go ahead with a great expansion of local radio or whether to curtail the operation, perhaps even to cancel what's happened so far. Successful or not, this experiment was broadcasting on a shoestring. At Leicester, the station manager was also the football commentator. Leicester City won, Leeds United nil, back to Epic. House. It was a new way of working. Jobs that used to be specialised were done by everyone. You would have to do absolutely everything. You would need to prepare all the records for a record programme, you would need to write the news, you would go out reporting, edit all your own material, and that was the great fun of it. It was probably, when I think of all the jobs I've had in my lifetime uh, at work, I think this was one of the most uh, exciting times of my life. One of the new breed of breakfast show presenters was happy to show off his multitasking skills. I noticed your hands moving around feverishly around here. What are you doing? Uh, well, I'm feeling like an octopus, actually, but all these controls here operate when actually it goes to uh, the listener's radio set. I can do it all myself. And uh, personally, I think it's uh, one of the most wonderful times in the morning. I particularly enjoy breakfast. And uh, talking of breakfast at this very moment, ladies and gentlemen, if you're having your breakfast well, drink a cup of coffee with me. Oh, memories, memories. Actually, that desk, um, you know, became so familiar because you operated it every day, did the whole damn thing yourself. I think if I went back now, um, I could just jump into the seat and do it. It was great fun. Now I'd like to introduce you to a young man whose lifelong ambition has been to be a disc jockey. People, I think, felt a part of the community. They felt a part of the experiment. Um, and it wasn't difficult to get people into the studio. It was a sense of uh, involvement that everybody had. There were good days. I mean, lo looking back, though, um, I feel 
a sense of uh, cringe in one way, seeing myself as I was all those years ago, because, you know, I was much, much too smooth. I wouldn't buy a second-hand car from someone like that. But at the same time, I feel an enormous pride, because I was part of this uh, revolution. Well, hi there, you good people at home and in hospital. This is Radio Leeds inviting you to sit down and sing with us here in the Odeon Theatre in the Hedro Leeds. The stations could only afford an hour of records a day, so they had to think up new ways of making shows. BBC cameras came to poke fun at Radio Leeds' opening day. But the station was proud of its poverty and its ingenuity. Our record library isn't as big as the main BBC one, so we thought up, bring a disc where you can ask for any record in the whole world, as long as you bring it along to the studios yourself so that we can play it. Hello, this is Ralph Robinson, your man from Auntie, with the only BBC programme money can buy. You can buy time on OPMCB simply by sending a donation to charity. So send in your requests and your offers of cash. Remember, it's your money we're after. Let's hope we get piles. Struggling to survive. But even at the very heart of the BBC, some didn't think the new idea deserved any funding at all. There were many at the BBC, at uh, Broadcasting House as well as Television Centre, who rather regarded BBC Local Radio as an unwelcome baby left on the doorstep. And really, they would just as soon have left it crying than bring it in, keep it warm and fan it up. Here I am, indeed, on this wet, cold, nuts in November morning at Ed Walton in the nice, warm, cosy home of Mrs Josephine Cutts. Hello, Mrs Cutts. Hello. Here's the local forecast for Sheffield and Rotherham. Little general change is expected with the very mild weather continuing. I'm going to ask Constable Gunn a few questions for our starting point series. What sort of things happen to you when you're driving around? One, two... But a lack of cash wasn't the only problem. With on-air keep fit and talking budgie contests, local radio was in danger of becoming a joke. There was little contact with the rest of the BBC, and if the corporation didn't take it seriously, why should the listeners? BBC in London thought we were completely deranged. It kept dealing with impossible demands. One of ours was, why does our transmitter keep going off air? And back came a BBC memo, which was the sort of thing that... BBC did with local radio. It sent a very pompous memo from the head of engineering which said, Radio Dharma, ah, yes, transmitter number XYZ. This transmitter has had functioning problems for some time. Unfortunately, we are unable to help you due to the fact that its plans were lost during the Blitz. Now, what about a record request for you and the family? Could I have for my young daughter? Those were the days by Mary Hopkins. We'll be pleased to play that. I remember ringing up the BBC uh, Record Library in London, uh, ringing up the switchboard at BBC Broadcasting House, uh, and um, I asked to be put through to the Record Library because I wanted to order the record requested for the next day's um, programme. And um, the lady on the switchboard said, well, who are you? And I said, we're BBC Radio Leicester. Uh, that's where I'm speaking from. And she said, there's no such thing, and immediately pulled the plug on me. It was time to fight back. The manager of Radio Leeds used the visit of a BBC film crew from London as a chance to enter the propaganda war. The whole of local radio is, is a risky business. We like risk here, we live dangerously. Nobody would join local radio at the moment, you know, unless they were fond of risks. How has the BBC reacted? Uh, you mean the BBC in London? Because we're part of the BBC, though people don't believe it. Yes, oh, they've reacted. Well, you know, I had one of the... Uh, by coincidence, one of the BBC's Gestapo came down and uh, the... Uh, if you look at the man standing behind you, you know, he's, uh, <laughs> he's doing well. Broadcasting to County Durham 20 and a half hours every day. This is Radio Durham. It seemed there was more positive coverage of local radio by the supposed rivals at ITV than by the BBC. Yet another hectic assignment for Radio Durham reporter Ernie Brown. In the space of less than an hour and a half, he will have to drive the 12 miles to the source of his new story, find the man concerned, get him to agree to an interview, and rush the finished tape back to the studio in Durham in readiness for the lunchtime news programme broadcast live at 12.45. 
a young Kate Aidy was learning the tricks of the trade. She picked up her first lesson about TV. Just do what the director tells you. It's all faked. Every walk in, every walk out, every bit of the studio, yeah. I mean, we were there and we did it. And we had to because we couldn't actually cope on air most of the time. Radio Durham, 96.8, sensational. We were the station who drove its radio car under a low bridge while the mast was still up. And we caused them a, a lot of angst. <laughs> <laughs> we were having a great time. I don't know if our listeners did. Mike Hollingsworth is one of the leading figures behind the programme. Joining Kate at Durham was Mike Hollingsworth, who'd been promoted from his job at Leicester. He was being filmed again, this time by the commercial competition. I think probably the people who were really fascinated by what we were doing were commercial television. Um, certainly in Durham, we had a lot of interest from Time Tees Television, which was the local ITV broadcaster at the time. And it may, of course, have been that some of the commercial boys were hovering around looking to see whether maybe commercial radio was going to come in. Time for another record. Bluebeat hits the north of England in the form of Mr Jimmy Cliff, so up tight, out of sight, and everything's going to be all right. When Granada filmed Radio Merseyside in 1968, they found a station ready for the commercial threat. The worst of local radio is to have non-stop pop dedication programmes Gillian Reynolds was interviewed by Granada. She believes she knows why the film was made. If you ever wonder why Granada Television was making a film about BBC local radio, um, it may, of course, be an intellectual interest, but it might just have had something to do with the fact that um, broadcasting was pregnant and this time the baby was commercial radio. Right, there it was, Revival and Lovers Everywhere on the Atco label. Time on Radio Luxembourg is 23 and a half minutes past 8 o'clock and green is for... Commercial radio was popular and it looked like expanding across the country. The fear for BBC local radio was that the government might abandon them and give out licences to commercial stations. Rival broadcasters were circling. One of them was the TV star Huey Green. We have put all these dots on here which represent the 115 medium frequency, which everybody can hear, medium frequency, low powered local stations, which will be able to be heard both by day and by night. To hit back, BBC local radio turned to publicity stunts. Radio Leeds handed their studios over to teenagers. It attracted plenty of media coverage and gave the youngsters a chance to shine. Uh, and I really don't think anybody has brought this point out in our favour. And if we're not as good professionals as Gordon says, well, all we need is more practice. And at least we've had a go and has done us damn best and nobody seems to say that for us. Gerald Jackson was one of those teenagers. He was hooked. I wanted some film of Radio Leeds. I don't think I was brave enough to do that during the, the work day when everybody was around. I used to work with a, a guy called Nigel Fell. Uh, Nigel and I were two of the youngest people on the radio station. So I did it on a Saturday night when there was just me and Nigel and a couple of other people in. And I filmed a bit of Nigel uh, sitting at the control desk broadcasting. And then uh, I think we codded it up, actually, because I don't think I was actually on the radio. I then sat in front of the microphone and he filmed me with my headphones on and doing a bit of chat as well. It was a struggle, but slowly and surely, the new stations began to succeed, however basic their coverage. I used to do it down the telephone of the reports, and then I would have a... Do you remember a Ewer tape recorder, the old German heavy tape recorder, and I would record some commentary into it during the game and then bring that back and play it later as though it meant anything to anybody. You know, absurd, really. It's an absurd idea playing a, playing a delayed radio commentary. It doesn't work. Radio should be live if it's commentary. But we used to do things like that to begin with. There were other achievements too. For their day, the new radio cars were cutting edge technology. Hello, radio car calling studio. Good morning, Jane Huff. This is BBC Radio's take on that. You'd like to play. And like one innovation you? was a real change. Local stations took a risk and allowed listeners to ring in. 
the radio phone-in arrived at the BBC. You're not standing too near a radio set, are you? Jolly good, because that makes a nasty whistle, you see, if you do. Radio Nottingham was the very first station, in fact, to uh, uh, use the phones. They started a, a phone-in. Oh, good night. Hi, June. Good morning. Uh, we did the first radio phone-in. I know everybody claims to have done the first radio phone-in, but I know we did the first radio phone-in. Um, I wonder if you could help me, please, in my or if anyone person. else can. I have a dog. He's a crossbreed. He's 19 months old, but a very, very bad dog. I have to say, I think we almost invented the phone-in, or at least we actually took to it, like ducks to water. Except for the fact, when we started on Radio Durham, absolutely nobody was listening, so nobody phoned in. This is D Nelson, D W E. I'm not going to make an exaggerated claim, because there are plenty of others who do that. We, on our opening day, tried a phone-in. We were on um, FM only, VHF, as it used to be called, which meant that only 40% of the population could even listen to Radio Sheffield. That was how low the ownership was. We didn't get medium wave until a lot later. So it was a real gamble doing a phone-in programme. If you know, you've already got your hands tied behind your back because less than half the public can hear you. Here's the weather, weather, weather now on but local radio was close to its audience, and it came into its own in emergencies and bad weather. We realised we tapped into something different. And local radio achieved lots of firsts. It found it could do things. And it was much more immediate than national radio. Opening mic. It's music through to 10 o'clock on Radio Leicester. This week, our angling expert, Ken Dexter, talks And this to is Kit Coxon welcoming you once again to Distic. So to wake you up, a little Harry James and Monday date. The new stations had shown what they could do. The two-year experiment was over. It was decision time. This is a little moment of history in British broadcasting. BBC Radio Bristol, the first of a new generation of local radio stations, is coming on the air. Frank Gillard had got what he wanted. The government allowed the BBC to go ahead with 20 local radio stations, all funded by the licence fee, not local authorities. I think it was inevitable that once they'd started up and once the pilot period was, was over, that local government should pull out. Better for the BBC to be absolutely seen to be independent, felt to be independent, and to be able to demonstrate its independence. And there we have it with the time coming up to three minutes past 11. You're listening to BBC Radio Bristol, your local radio station. We did think we were achieving something and breaking new ground in radio, getting more voices on air and saying to a much larger number of people, radio's for everyone. BBC Radio Lancashire with Gerald Jackson. Very good afternoon to you, Gerald Jackson, with you live through till six. On a now there are 40 BBC local radio stations attracting almost 8 million listeners every week. 40 years on, Gerald Jackson is still broadcasting. BBC Radio Lancashire. It is the people that is the thing that's continued. From the, the, the listeners we knew back in, in the 1960s used to bob into reception, I could give you another group of people exactly the same today in 2007 who come into this radio station and they'll just bob in for a chat or they'll ring up for a chat and occasionally they'll ask you to play them a record. It is the people, and that's what local radio is all about, isn't it? Next on BBC Four, Marcus Brigstock is back with a brand new late edition.